Ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues, welcome to the 16th Annual International Forum on Quality and Safety in Healthcare. I'm Fiona Godley, I'm Editor-in-Chief of the BMJ and delighted to welcome you all here on behalf of IHI and the BMJ Group. Our theme this year of better health, safer care, lower costs aims to address the pressing challenges facing the global quality improvement movement. This is our biggest forum ever. Many of you will remember last year in Nice with the volcano. And the forum took place against the odds. You'll remember that we regaled each other of heroic journeys across the world by train, taxi, elephant and camel. <laughs> and for those who couldn't make it, the forum managed to lay on impressive live satellite streaming of the whole event. With all these challenges, the forum reached delegates in 76 countries. This year, under rather more prosaic circumstances, we are reaching people in over 83 countries. So in addition to everyone in this auditorium, we have two satellite rooms with live streaming who are also watching this event. Altogether here in Amsterdam, we have 2,800 delegates, which is really a wonderful success. And as many people again are tuning in via our live broadcast and remote participation sites around the world. So first of all, I want to say hello to our delegates in the satellite rooms and also hello to those delegates joining us via our live broadcast. It's wonderful to have you all with us. I'd also like to welcome people in a rather strange virtual sense who will be joining us via our new remote participation program in a range of countries, Norway, England, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Hong Kong, Japan, Scotland, Russia and the USA. It's fantastic that you've taken the opportunity to um, involve yourselves in the forum with the remote participation. I've got two specific sets of thanks to give. First to our sponsors, A.T. Kearney, Baxter, Booper, Dr. Foster Intelligence, Hill Rom, Medtronic, Pfizer, and the Dutch Council for Quality of Healthcare. We're extremely grateful to you for your support. A second thank you to all of our exhibitors. Uh, I hope you will be sure to visit them in the exhibit hall. In a moment, we're going to show you a video which will give you some information about the conference because it's a complicated few days and we want to make sure that you get the very most out of it. But before I do that, we're going to just, uh, there's three things to highlight. The posters. We had a record number of posters this year. 500 posters are on display. Thank you to all of you who've come to Amsterdam with your posters. Um, please, delegates, join us for drinks and canapes at the poster reception today, straight after the last keynote. And obviously, if you are presenting a poster, please be there to um, discuss it with those who come to see it. The second thing is um, to encourage you to visit the Dutch Corner, which I think everyone who's been there and who was involved in yesterday's Dutch Day um, has seen as an enormous success. There's a lunchtime session today on the Dutch experience with WHO and the Joint Commission on Global Safety. So please do go to that if you can. And the third thing to mention is our student programme. Uh, welcome to all of the students who've come here. You are the next generation of quality improvement professionals and we're extremely proud to have you with us. This year we have a dedicated track for students and tutors led by the team at IHI Open School. We have over a hundred students with us this year which is a fantastic thing. Thank you very much and now the video. The Institute for Healthcare Improvement and the BMJ Publishing Group welcome you to the 16th International Forum on Quality and Safety in Healthcare. Joining us at Amsterdam's Rye Conference Centre this year are 2,500 delegates from over 70 countries, including nearly 100 students. The past year has seen many challenges for the quality and patient safety movement, confounded by the continued financial pressures our healthcare systems are facing. This year's theme of better health, safer care, lower costs aims to practically address these issues. In this week, we will examine how to continue to strive for excellence in quality and safety while facing the reality of the need to reduce costs. Your programme is structured into six streams to capture aspects of today's quality improvement movement. 
These will help you to navigate through our comprehensive programme and enable you to select the sessions that will maximise your experience and learning at the forum. The streams are Safe and Reliable Care Service Redesign and Transformation Leadership and Business Management Clinical Improvement and Innovation Patient Partnerships Learning, Education and Culture the sessions range from lecture-style presentations through to smaller interactive workshops. There will be six keynote speakers at this year's conference who promise to distill current thinking and inspire you to effect real change in your area. Our local hosts this year are the Dutch Healthcare Inspectorate and the Netherlands Organisation for Health Research and Development. They will be presenting our Dutch showcase area between the registration and exhibition areas featuring inspiring world-class Dutch initiatives on quality improvement, patient safety and cost reduction. Showcases and demonstrations of Dutch technological innovations will be going on here, as well as some special surprise activities that will be announced on screens throughout the venue. For more on quality improvement in the Netherlands, we've got a special lunchtime presentation on Thursday by Wim Schellekens and Roland Baal. There are over 500 posters this year, each in themed areas in the lounge auditorium on the ground and first floors. Join us for drinks and canapes at the poster reception on Wednesday immediately after the last keynote. This will be a great opportunity to network, view the posters and talk to the authors. Our exhibition hall on the ground floor is open every day from 8am and has over 50 exhibitors. In addition, we have eight sponsored breakfast sessions from 7.45 each morning, where a complimentary breakfast will be served while you hear about the latest advances in improvement and safety. You can find us on Facebook, where we can continue discussions well into the coming year. You can also follow at Quality Forum on Twitter and use the hashtag Quality2011 to mark your tweets and see what other people are posting. The City of Amsterdam has many exciting activities and experiences that you can enjoy while you're here. There is a desk on site here at the Rye Conference Centre where you can inquire about local sightseeing, restaurants and arrange for taxis. On behalf of the BMJ Publishing Group and the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, welcome to the 16th International Forum on Quality and Safety in Healthcare. so much to do, so little time. Um, just one important announcement about the programme, a slight change in the programme um, for today's keynote presentations. Atul Gawande will be joining us live via satellite from Boston at 12 o'clock in this auditorium here. And David Pension, who was to have spoken at that time, will present his keynote at 4.45pm also in this auditorium. I hope you'll be able to join us for both of those. I want now to thank our local hosts, the Netherlands Organisation for Health Research and Development and the Dutch Healthcare Inspectorate. And here to say a few words on behalf of the Netherlands is the Dutch Healthcare Inspectorate's Inspector General and Chief Medical Officer, Herit van der Waal. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I would also like to welcome you to the annual International Forum on Quality and Safety in Healthcare. And I'm proud that this year we convene in the Netherlands in my hometown, Amsterdam, so I could come by bike this morning. <laughs> when it comes to healthcare, these are the issues that have always been key all over the world for every nation and every government for as long as we can remember affordability, accessibility and quality. But at the end of the day, it's all about quality. Not just the quality of the care, of the cure, the hospitals, but also of long-term care and prevention. Quality and particularly safety are today's top public health issues. And when we say public health, it's really about the public's health, the health of the public. The citizen should remain healthy because of prevention. The patient 
should get better because of the cure and the client should achieve a better quality of life through care. Or to put it differently, with the help of the 5Ds concept, death, disease, disability, discomfort and dissatisfaction, it all boils down to reduce these 5Ds as much as possible. And we all need to chip in so that this goal may be achieved, for instance, by establishing good safety management and quality systems through good leadership and governance, by developing and maintaining guidelines and standards, by means of the evaluation of interventions, and by measuring eff effects. All based on a well thought out mix of intrinsic, intrinsic motivation combined with external carrots and sticks. Many parties play a role in this medical, medical and other healthcare professionals, executive managers and internal supervisory bodies, politicians and government workers, researchers, healthcare insurers and also external supervisors such as the National Healthcare Inspectorate in my country. And it's fabulous that all these parties have gathered here for the next few days in order to learn from each other. And furthermore, they have come from such a variety of nations, countries with similar challenges but different solutions. Share one another's experiences and translate the lessons learned to your own practice or pass them on in your own country. I am convinced that by doing so you will contribute to improving the public's health now and in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish you an inspiring convention. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Herod. We would like to dedicate this conference to people in healthcare agencies around the world who are rebuilding their healthcare services after natural disasters and political unrest. And we can all think of countries where this is happening as we speak. But there is a special live broadcast here at 12.45 p.m. where we're linking live with colleagues in Japan, in, in Fukushima. We have Professor Shigeatsu Hashimoto of Fukushima University Hospital and Professor Ryuki Kasai, a community physician who is also a member of the BMJ's editorial board. And they will be speaking to us live and also will have um, other Japanese colleagues on the stage to try to understand um, more about what's going on and what, if anything, we can do to help. So I hope you'll join us at 12.45 in this auditorium for that live broadcast. Now, moving to the main event this morning, I'm delighted to introduce our first keynote speaker. She is the President and Chief Executive of the Institute of Healthcare Improvement, previously served as IHI's Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer for 15 years. She is prominent as an authority in improving healthcare systems. Her expertise has been recognised by her elected membership to the Institute of Medicine and her appointment to the Commonwealth Fund's Commission on a High Performance Health System. She is an instructor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and a research associate in the Brigham and Women's Hospital Division of Social Medicine and Health Inequalities. And here to launch our conference for us is Maureen Bidignano. Good morning, <laughs> and thanks so much, Fiona, for those kind comments. On behalf of the BMJ and IHI, I also want to take a moment to welcome you to Amsterdam to the International Forum on Quality and Safety. Here in Amsterdam, one of my favorite cities on earth, we have almost 2,800 strong. And I know by the time you leave this afternoon and, or by Friday, uh, you'll feel the same way I do, which is filled with enthusiasm and ideas. Uh, you'll have new friends, new relationships, pockets filled with business cards, and lots of um, energy to return to your home organizations and implement all the great ideas that you'll learn here this week. 
I remember visiting the town of Delft in, uh, at the invitation of Vim Schellikens in 2002. He invited me to give a talk at the hospital that he was then leading, Renier de Graaf Gasthus. And my travel schedule in 2002 was overwhelming, and so I originally called him and told him that I couldn't make it, but he told me that his hospital was celebrating its 750th anniversary. So how could I say no? I, Delft wasn't the first place that I visited in the Netherlands, but it cemented my love for all things Dutch. Ik wil me half Netherlands. <laughs> The challenges that we face in healthcare today exist at several different levels. Structural, populations, and the complexity of caring. In most countries that I visit at a structural level, executives are telling me that they're dealing with financial constraints, they're dealing with regulatory changes, implementing health uh, in information technology, health system strengthening, and all kinds of barriers. What health executives are telling me these days is that oftentimes they feel like strategy is happening to their organization from the outside in. They feel like their eyes are on the outside and they're spending so much time really dealing with constraints and rules and changes uh, that are coming in from the outside. They want to feel more focused inside. And so I'm going to give you some methods today, I think, to really begin to think about how do we deal outside in and inside out. A second level of challenge that we're dealing with today is at the population level. In the US, as in many of the countries represented in this room today, what we see is a dramatic increase in the percent of the population that's over 65 years old. And what we're, what we're caring for is multiple uh, chronic conditions, uh, polypharmacy, a great deal of burden as the large percentage of the population grows over 65. I think that we're going to need some new models of care in order to keep that population over 65 healthy, vibrant, and as close to uh, fully functional as we possibly can. And across the globe, we're also seeing, interestingly, at the same time that the percent of the population over 65 is growing, we're seeing what some are calling the youth bulge. And here, we're seeing demographic transitions that, especially in North America, Europe, and Japan, uh, where the mortality rates are falling faster than the fertility rates. So the result is a youth bulge. And for, I'm very optimistic about this on the one hand, but on the other hand, again, the kind of care that we provide to youth is going to need to change. You can picture the math that if the population over 65 is growing very fast and we've got this youth bulge, where is the population shrinking? And that's us here in this room, the caregivers for the youth and the elderly. Uh, so we really need, I think, to think about some new designs. More and more research is showing how, a predict, how strongly a predictor early health is for the rest of our healthy lives. At South Central Foundation in Anchorage, Alaska, they've started thinking about gestation as a five-year event. They call it the five-year gestation. And the idea here rests on the notion that in the first five years of life, one's health of a lifetime is pretty much determined. So they're designing care for that first five years and therefore maximizing health uh, for the rest of the next 70 years. Another major challenge that we're facing at the population level is obesity. In the United States, in uh, 1985, we started collecting data on obesity rates by state. And by 1990, we started to get more information about the rates of obesity state by state. By 1995, we had to add a new category for obesity. In, in, in 2000, we added another category. In 2005, we added two more categories. And by 2009, you can see a country that's dramatically uh, shifting to a, an obese population. The most amazing thing about this slide is that this change from relatively uh, 
lean population to relatively obese population didn't happen in my lifetime. It happened in my son's lifetime. Between 1985 and 2009, this dramatic change happened. And though obesity is very critical in the United States, it's not only a United States problem. As you can see here from the slide, we've got obesity problems around the globe. And if you note, the gray um, parts of the world doesn't mean that they aren't obese. It means that we don't have data on that part of the world. So we've got huge uh, segments of our population that are growing older. We've got a younger population that needs attention and nurturance. We've got an obese population that's adding to the burden of chronic disease. And we've got uh, the increases in um, non-communicable diseases as well. In Nigel Crisp's excellent book, Turning the World Upside Down, he describes the growing burden of non-communicable diseases in low and middle income countries. Though communicable diseases like HIV and malaria and TB still kill most people in sub-Saharan Africa and account for a huge burden of disease in Asia, the growing problem of non-communicable diseases such as cardiac disease and diabetes, uh, these kind of chronic conditions are also causing burden and need change in the healthcare system so that we can best provide for these populations. And there are segments of the population that in the United States we've taken to call the hot spots. They, um, they're the most vulnerable of our populations. They're the 5% of our population that account for just under 50% of total health care spending in the United States. We need new ways to care for these patients holistically, proactively, and completely. And when we do provide care that way, we're seeing much better outcomes at a lower cost. So we're seeing some glimmers of hope. And patients at the end of life also need real attention in the way that we provide care for them. In Massachusetts, the state where I live, a new report on the importance of decision making at the end of life was just issued last week. And what it talks about is new conversations that we need to have with patients about their wishes at the end of life, and then new teaching for all of us in healthcare on how to respect and honor those wishes reliably. The diversity in our patients, from ethnicity to patient preferences to customs and history, is huge. Atul Gawande, who will join us at noon by video conference, told me a few weeks ago that in the mid-1970s, the average patient in the United States required 2.5 full-time equivalents, 2.5 staff members, to care for them during the course of a hospitalization. Just 20 years later, in the mid-90s, that number shifted from 2.5 to 19.5. So what we're seeing is complexity everywhere in healthcare. We're seeing complexity in the actual care transactions at an individual level. We're seeing complexity in every hospitalization. In a way, you could think that the new technology, the new interventions, the new technicians, the new kinds of caregivers are improving healthcare, and they are. But on the same token, they're adding to the complexity of the system, and we need to pull it all together. That's our job. Patients often see many clinicians during the course of a year, and they struggle, as we do, to keep it all together, to make sense of it. I met a patient a few weeks ago, and she pulled out a box of medicine, and she said, these are the medications that I juggle. And I asked Judith about each one. I said, what about this medication and what about that? And she was really pretty knowledgeable about each one of the medications. But what she told me is that she was afraid of making another medication mistake that was going to cause her to be put back into the hospital. It had happened to her in the past six months, and she was very fearful that it would happen to her again. So when I asked her about getting guidance from her physician, she started moving the bottles around. She put some bottles here and some there. She said, these are from my general primary care physician, these are from my obstetrician, and these are from my, my heart specialist. And she said, the problem is that they don't talk to each other. She said, I'm the only one that's got the full list. And Judith described the burden on her as one physician would change a medication and she would then need to call all the other physicians and say, does this change require a change in my other meds or in my treatment plan? 
And I met another patient, Rose, a few weeks ago, who told me this. She said her journey through complex cancer care was, she said, technically magical. Rose found scientific and evidence-based protocols that helped her to fight off a scary and potentially lethal cancer. Rose loves her doctors and nurses. Rose even loves her chemotherapy. Rose even loved her radiation therapy. Rose isn't afraid of care. Rose is scared of not being in care. What she told me is that she finds two things distressing beyond her ability to cope. One is the gap between people, and the other is the gap between care. She says we don't talk to each other nearly enough. And she says that we look at health care as interventional. She says it's about appointments and tests and interventions and procedures. And then you're done. And Rose said, put me back together. Put me back together spiritually, my mind, my body, and my spirit. And when you send me home after my treatments are done, she said, my pain then begins. And I said, what do you mean by that, Rose? And she said, I'm alone, and I'm frightened, I'm depressed. And she said, you, she said, you said, I'm fine. You say, I'm done. When I go home, I know how I feel. And she said, care is not a journey. Care is a journey, not a visit. And so Rose is asking us to make some changes in the way that we care for patients with devastating illness. Care is a journey, not a visit. So we've got some challenges at the governmental and organizational level, and there are challenges in the health of the population. There are challenges in complexity in caring for patients. And our systems, I think, were largely designed to treat disease and illness. But the complexity of care has grown exponentially. A physician today has 13,600 possible diagnoses to make and over 6,000 possible medications to select from in the United States. So as we all struggle to keep the newest, most relevant scientific information on the top of mind, we have to think about all that complexity, and then we've got to think about the patient's insight, the patient's preferences, because they have a place too. So where is the light? The challenges are many. Uh, I think we're going to need some new ways to think about leadership and some new ways to think about structure. So I want to talk with you about two things. One is some new ways to lead and then what that leadership might look like in improving care. I'm going to propose a path forward and a best promise, I think, is all of the people in this room, in the, in the uh, satellite rooms, all of the people who will be watching this, this broadcast, one of our IHI board members said to me once, she said, we're excellent at everything, but just not everywhere. If we all adopt IHI's philosophy of all teach, all learn, we can uncover the best research, we can uncover and apply best practices, and we can raise the bar globally for healthcare and for patients everywhere. But let's start with leadership. Leaders face great challenges today. As I said, they're feeling like strategies being set for them. They are caught between regulation and government, inspection and the patients. They're working with complicated staff structures. And they're focused very much on financial issues. And they're calling me and asking me, well, how do I pay attention to the patient? How do I know that the financial questions and decisions I'm making in the front office aren't negatively impacting on the front line? I think to answer these questions, we're going to need two kinds of new leadership thinking. The first on your left is new ways to think about the interpersonal skills of leadership. David Brooks, who's a New York Times columnist, is writing about humanistic skills. He writes that we need a whole different approach to leadership. We need to understand each other. We need to pay attention to one another and listen. It's not so much about command and control leadership anymore as it is getting out and talking to people, understanding patient preferences, understanding the gifts that the staff all bring, and creating a sense of teamness and collaboration that will allow us to provide care in these complex settings. And then we're going to need some new kind of structures, I think, as well. 
a rapidly uh, changing and adapting system is going to need some new ways to think. I brought a picture of the, the uh, New England Patriots, my local New York, um, American football team. Because I think that what they do in terms of huddles is really a hallmark of the way that new leaders are going to have to work. Structured huddles are ideal communication vehicles in complex adaptive systems. They're fast, they're focused, they're highly collaborative. They bring the information from every person to the fore, and yet there's clearly a person who's going to call the play. They increase trust, they enhance interactions between workers, while generating knowledge and facilitating management. In healthcare, I'm seeing organizations adopt multidisciplinary huddles. And what I'm seeing is that they prevent problems. They're proactive. I see teams of doctors and nurses, pharmacists and social workers gathering at the beginning of the day and they're looking forward to what might go wrong. And in doing that, they're all sharing their concerns, their worries, and they're creating safer and more agile healthcare systems. They're preventing communication breakdowns. They're preventing medication errors. They're improving transitions in care, and they're improving the patient's experience because the patients are no longer saying, don't you talk to one another. I just told your colleague what I needed when I go home. So I know when I'm making rounds in a hospital that I'm in a safe place, I'm in a proactive place, when I see huddles happening at different parts during the day, and I see people talking to one another about their worries and their concerns. Another way to mitigate the complexity of healthcare is to kind of walk the front line. Uh, Jim Womack, one of the pioneers in lean thinking, recently published a book. It's called Gemba Walks, Gemba meaning the front line. And he identifies and follows all the major pathways of care. And what he's doing as a leader is he's walking care from end to end. He's looking at where there are blockages, where there are delays, where there are holdups and problems. And he's saying, as a leader, he's facilitating those on the front line to create smooth flow. And again, in doing so, the mapping and the walking, it's new kind of leadership behavior. But what I can see when I'm making rounds in hospitals around the world is when the leaders are out doing Gemba walks, they're empowering, they're teaching, and they're facilitating those on the front line. It's all teach, all learn, and the leaders are actually walking and modeling that. Remember the IHI board member who said, we're excellent at everything, but just not everywhere. The challenge she was identifying was spread. She was saying, it's the leader's role to make sure that we deliver on the promise of care. You shouldn't get better care because you are admitted onto one patient unit or you're being seen in one ambulatory clinic. As leaders, we need to be able to promise that the best practices anywhere are adopted everywhere. And that goes not only for the different units in your hospital, but different regions in a country, one hospital to another and one country to another. That's the true path for global improvement. IHI several years ago developed a framework for spread, and the Mayo Clinic adopted it. And they now use this method of spread to keep the promise of what they call one mayo. One mayo. That means that they're making a promise that regardless of where you get admitted in the mayo system, you're going to get the very best care because the leaders are saying, we promise you, we'll take on the ownership of spread. We also need to identify best practices between regions and countries. And I brought along a slide from some work we're doing between IHI and the National Catholic Health Service in Ghana, because I think this is a great example of leaders taking ownership of spread. We started several years ago in working on reducing mortality for children under five in three regions in the north part of Ghana. And very deliberately, this map shows how the team there on the ground is moving these best practices from the three regions in the north, deliberately right across, entering now wave three, with a promise to be able to give best practice and best care to 3.3 million people across the population of Ghana. And we're now receiving requests from other countries saying, how do we do this? We now realize that spread isn't a natural act 
that people resist change in a lot of ways. That if they see someone else doing it, they want to create something new for themselves, and yet it's leader's role to keep these promises, I think. So we're going to need new leadership skills, I think, and structures, and I think we're going to need new aims, new global aims, new ways to think about the promises we're making to patients. I'm going to propose to you that a new way for us to think about care is what I'm calling the IHI triple aim. This is, can we as leaders improve the health of a population, at the same time deliver on the experience of care, and do it at a lowest cost per capita? We're going to need new ways to think about this, but let me give you a tour around the triple aim and show you what are some of the Light, the bright lights I see around the world and how I see people sharing and learning from one another. We'll start with the experience of care. The way we define that is through the Institute of Medicine's six aims. We say care, when you're in the care system, should be safe and effective. It should be patient-centered, timely, efficient, and equitable. And so many organizations around the world are taking this as their goals, taking this as their agenda. An example is some work that started in uh, Scotland. It's one of the most amazing uh, programs, the Safer Patients program in Scotland. And they aim for, they have very lofty aims to become the safest place to be hospitalized in Scotland. What happened there is the leaders in Scotland broke down safety, got everybody in the same room, and started working on central line infections, on ventilator associated pneumonia on C. diff and on general uh, hand hygiene. And as they made improvements across the country, what happened is then we started to see those improvements spreading around the world. And there's now a project starting in North Carolina that's based exactly on the work that's happening in Scotland. So we're starting to see all teach and all learn. Somebody says, I'll take this problem and solve it on behalf of the whole. And there really are no boundaries to spread now. If we come back to the list of IOM aims, you might want to work on efficiency. So how might you tackle efficiency? It, at uh, one of our uh, IHI faculty, Jean Litvak, is an expert in flow. And he started working with the leaders at Cincinnati Children's Hospital in, um, in Cincinnati, Ohio, in the United States. We have several leaders here in the room today from Cincinnati Children's, and I hope that you'll go and learn the details of how they worked on efficiency. But they said, we've got a, a need to do two things. We've got to improve our care for patients, and at the same time, make it more efficient. So they started defining what does efficient best care mean. And they said it's the right patient at the right place, right time, right care, and no delays, no delays. So they started to work on this idea of flow and safety. And over the course of a few years, they said we can't let flow be passive. We need to actively manage it, figure out where the patients are being delayed, stuck in an intensive care bed, as an example, when they should be on a medical surgical floor, but there's no room, or stuck in an A&E ward or an emergency department because they can't get up to the operating room or the intensive care. And they kept committing themselves to the best route is easy, smooth flow across the system. The initial results of the redesign are pretty dramatic. They've decreased waiting times for patients, and what that does is it allows them to take care of more children with the same physical resources and the same staffing resources, because they're moving the patients quickly through the system exactly as it should be. And what you see here is that they were able to take care of more children basically with the exact same resources. They start to count what I love, they call them flow failures. Any time a child is stuck in a wrong place or a wrong bed, they count that as a failure. It's not just the patient's delayed, but it's a failure of the system. And so the leaders are now saying, we're going to smooth out the flow. And as they did so, they're able to produce much more care with the same physical assets and the same staffing assets. It's a dramatic improvement, I think. And in doing so, they did such a great job that what happened was a group in Canada called and said, could you teach us how to do this? And so 
Eugene Litvax started to bring some of the ideas from Cincinnati up to Canada, and then the folks in Canada started to teach some people in South Carolina. So what you start to see is people saying, I'll solve a problem for my patients, and then a global spread can happen to solve problems on behalf of all patients. As we come back to looking at um, the uh, IOM aims, I want to talk for a minute about patient-centeredness because that's my passion. That's the reason I came into healthcare. And I just light up when, we're, when I'm sitting with patients and hearing how the healthcare system's helping them and how we can make it better. I've met so many amazing people over the past few years, and especially this last year, being out on the road a lot. But one of the people that I met is a, a journalist. Her name is Karen Barrow, and she writes for the New York Times. If you go on to the New York Times online, what you'll see if you hit the health button is she writes a piece called Patient Voices, and she's cataloged 30 different diseases, interviewed about 240 patients now, and what she's doing is just asking them in little video clips, tell me your story. What she's doing is she's helping us to see the burden of the illness. Because what's, what she's telling us is how the, the illness is not only impacting the patient clinically, but how it's impacting their children or their parents, how it's changing their life dramatically. She's helping us as healthcare people to see the burden of the illness. And I think our job is to work on the burden of the treatment. If we can't decrease the burden of the illness, and oftentimes we can't, we can make treatment easier. We can understand what we're putting someone through, and we can work to make the designs of treatment better. At Marillac Clinic in uh, Grand Junction, Colorado, as an example, they care for a very poor, underserved population. And they often have t trouble with transportation getting to the clinic. So rather than have the patient come in and see a primary care physician one day and then have the doctor say, you need to come back to see the dentist or you need to come back to see the psychiatrist, what they've done is they've created an open shared visit. So when a patient comes in, all of the care providers surround the patient and they make it easy for that patient to get complete care, which is much more reliable in improving clinical outcomes. In New Zealand, there's a program called Fauna Aura for the Maori population, which doesn't put just the patient at the center, it puts the family at the center. Because so often they recognized when a Maori patient comes in that they may be coming in with a clinical symptom, but the real problem and the real solution is getting the whole healthcare system, the whole family, uh, into the right care settings. So what we're seeing here is global spread. I uh, have the great fortune to work with Martha Hayward, the first patient who IHI has um, hired. And Martha recently uh, suffered breast cancer. And so she developed a small string of beads. And the beads actually um, show the size of different tumors. Uh, what she did was then went over to Urkutsk in Russia, and she taught women over there who believe that cancer is a death sentence. They don't even say the word cancer because they know that it means the end of their life. And she said, no, look at me, I'm alive. And she gave each of them a string of beads. And the beads show this is how big the cancer will be if you get a mammogram. This is how big the cancer will be if a doctor detects it. And this is how big the cancer will be if you wait until you detect it. And all over the country, what you're seeing is women talking about, I'm going to get my mammogram. This one little string of beads is changing life. Uh, from a breast cancer survivor in New England going to Russia. And then I wanted to introduce you to another patient who could help us to understand how to decrease the burden of the treatment, the burden of the care system. Gilbert is a patient I met a few months ago, and I asked him if I could tell his story here, and he said, absolutely, if it would help you to understand the burden of illness he wants everyone to know. So Gilbert's 39. When he was 17 years old, he was playing with a handgun, and he shot himself accidentally, and the bullet is lodged in his spine. Gilbert's paraplegic, and I asked him when I was talking with him about what his life is like, and he said, you mean my life in a chair? And I said yes, and he was telling me about the, uh, the wheelchair that he lives in.
When I asked him about his caregivers, his doctors and nurses, I mean, his face lights up. He says, you know, he said, they are, he said, it's comical how wonderful they are. He said, when I come in to get care, they know who I am. They remember me. They remember my family. They know all my pain and my symptoms, and we have this incredible interaction. He said, I love my care because when I get a lab test drawn, by the time I get back to my car and I'm putting my wheelchair in the car, he said, my cell phone's ringing and my lab results are on my cell phone. And he said, the doctor emails me a post-visit summary of these are all the things that we talked about, these are the things you said you would do, these are the things I'll do. He said, the relationship with the care system is incredible, it's positive, it's wonderful. So I said, well, tell me more about your chair. And so he was describing how it's the newest high-tech hydraulic chair. It only weighs 16 pounds, and he was describing the whole thing. And I said, have you ever had a problem with it, Gilbert? And he said, well, every now and then, because I um, out a lot, I um, get a flat tire. Now, I've been in healthcare for 30 years, and I have to say, I never really thought about somebody getting a flat tire in a wheelchair. And so I said to him, well, what happens when you get a flat tire? And he said, well, I have to call my primary care doctor. And I get, you know, I leave a message and then he calls me back. And I tell him I got a flat tire. And then I get a prescription for a replacement tire. <laughs> that was news to me. And then I said, well, what happens then? And he said, the primary care physician gives the prescription to the receptionist who sends it over to the durable medical equipment department. And they then kind of put it out to bid, and they try and find the matching tire. And then when the tire comes in, the receptionist will call me, and she'll tell me my tire's in. And then I'll come in and pick it up. And I said, Gilbert, how long does that take? And he said, three weeks. And I said, what do you do in the meantime? And he said, well, it's really hard to wheel with one flat tire, but I do, which of course throws his muscles out in his back, which means he has more pain medication that he needs to take. And somebody who was with us said, raised her hand, and she said, wait a minute, I got a flat tire last night, and I called roadside assistance, and they came and changed it within an hour. Why can't we do that for Gilbert? I said to him, Gilbert, do you have any other issues with respect to your, your technology? And he was telling me that he um, has to catheterize himself four or five times a day. He works in a hospital, so he wheels himself into the men's room, and he goes into the stall, and he catheterizes himself to relieve his urine. And then when he comes out, I said, what do you do? And he said, well, I have to wash the catheter, because the rules are that I get 20 catheters a month, but I use four or five a day. So I have to wash the catheters. So I'm in the sink in the men's room washing the catheters. And he said, all the other fellow male employees come into the men's room, and they can't understand this. They're a little freaked out by seeing me with the catheters in the sink. So I do it quickly, and maybe I don't do it completely. And I sometimes get urinary tract infections. So I asked my doctor, is there anything I can do about this? And he said, well, maybe you could microwave them in the microwave oven in the employee cafeteria. <laughs> So you can imagine that didn't go over very well either. So, so Gilbert said, he's, he's stuck. And I said, well, what happens? And he says, about six or seven times a year, he gets a urinary tract infection that's bad enough for him to be hospitalized. And he said, when he goes to the pharmacy, when he wheels himself in, there's a little shelf, and it says Gilbert Cipro, because he needs that drug so frequently that they keep it on its own shelf. Here, we're not understanding the burden of the illness, and we're not optimizing the burden of the treatment. We can do better for Gilbert, and we can do better for all of our patients when we start to understand that journey of their life and redesign care. I'll tell you right now, Gilbert gets enough catheters, and he has a spare tire so that he doesn't have to worry about this, but I said to the people in, in the audience with us, you can't stop at Gilbert. You've got to keep these promises for every patient every time. Another problem we've got is, is in uh, medication compliance. We call it medication adherence. And globally, this is everybody in this room, patient adherence to medication routines that we prescribe is roughly 50%. So we're busy writing prescriptions and handing them over, giving patients medication, and we're seeing compliance rates at over 50, uh, at right about 50% according to WHO. 
So that lack of adherence is, in the United States, causing these huge uh, burdens. 177 billion, it's the fourth leading cause of death. And I think the reason is we think we've done our job by writing the prescription, and we've got no idea, really, how, what's happening when the patients go home. At Mayo Clinic, they've created these little medication cards. And rather than write a prescription and hand it over, when a patient is newly diagnosed with diabetes, as an example, the physician will sit with six cards and say to the patient, there are six options here. We're going to find the prescription that really helps you the best. And they'll be talking th about things like weight, the impact of the different drugs on weight, on the cost of each drug. Because many times, the physicians didn't know the cost. They would prescribe a drug, the patient couldn't afford it, and then the next thing you know, we've got noncompliance. But side effects and the like. So we're starting to see these conversations emerge. My dream is that these cards from Mayo Clinic will be on IHI's website, and you can all pick them up and start using them within the next couple of months. So we've got the experience of care, and we've got per capita cost. And here is a place where I think every country really needs to think about waste. Even in our work in low and middle income countries, we still see waste. And we've got to make best efficient use of resources. Several years ago, we uh, had a group of uh, leaders from another industry that sat in an audience much like this when we announced the 100,000 Lives campaign in the United States. And they got so inspired that they said, we'll go out and teach places how to use lean. And so we found some places around the country that w were interested in this uh, in the United States and also in Bolton, England. And what we're seeing is dramatic results when you see the waste, when you focus on it, uh, and then you can get rid of it. You can provide much better quality outcomes at a lower cost. Dr. Patty Gabo, who's the CEO at Denver Health, told me recently that she saved $71 million of just waste out of her healthcare system, 30 million in the last year. She said, we're really getting good at getting better. And she said, now everybody sees waste, physicians and nurses, and they're working collaboratively to drive that out of the system. A health a partners in Minnesota, Another triple aim participant is also using these kind of tools and methods. And what you're seeing is they said, we're going to provide consistent care. It will be customized, it'll be convenient, and it'll be coordinated. And when we do it that way, you can see here that patient satisfaction is on the rise, their clinical outcomes are improving dramatically, and their costs are decreasing. So there are great ways to improve quality outcomes and to do it safely. And that's, these are the new skills that I think leaders need to learn. And then finally, on to health, because I do think in many healthcare systems, especially in the United States, we haven't focused nearly enough on health. There are thousands of us gathered here this week and we're not just committed to improving health care. We're all committed to improving health. It's perhaps, I think, the, I, the uh, triple aim's most important dimension and one we really need to focus on. My um, favorite uh, way to think about this is a, uh, from an idea from Bill Doherty. And he says that the greatest untapped resource that we've got in healthcare today are, is the will of patients and families. When we can collaborate like Mayo does with the medication cards, like we're all doing now with Gilbert, what we're seeing is improvements in health, not just better health care. So we can engage people. And there are things we can do today, even as we're redesigning our health care systems. There are things we can do we can measure. We can start to collaborate and we can start to think over time. In the United States, we've started to create a map of every state, and we're looking at socioeconomic status against health status. And what we're finding, not unlike what you will find in your countries as well, is that the poorer populations have the worst health. And so we're going state by state, and we're looking at our um, data here, and every now and then we're finding these little outliers, these counties that I've circled in the bottom right-hand part of your screen. 
When we look in those counties, they're very poor counties, but they've got great health. And we're trying to figure out what's going on there. We don't know the answer yet. But we do know that it requires collaboration, it requires some new ways to think. The more we find out about how to push health in these populations, the more we'll be talking about it at Future Forum, the more we'll be sharing ideas on how to focus on that aspect of the IHI triple aim, which is the health of the population. So we're looking at bucking the trend, but one place you might look is in Jönköping, Sweden. And again, we've got leaders here in the room who will be teaching you today about this. When they started to focus on childhood obesity, they thought very broadly. They thought about everything from what are we serving in school cafeterias? How do we teach parents about healthy cooking? My favorite idea in the upper uh, right-hand corner is the walking bus, where the school bus driver driver walks up and picks up the kids and then walks the, ch the children on to school. Not only are the kids in great shape, but the school bus drivers are a lot more healthy <laughs> as well. So we're looking at health holistically, and when we start to do that, I think we're getting a great sense of it. Remember the five-year gestation, thinking about how do we think about the birth process as really being conception to five years, and think about um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Antonovsky's um, thinking, uh, uh, challenge to us. He says, don't just think about disease, think about healthies as a continuum. And we're spending a lot of our time on the disease side of the continuum, and we need to back up and look at the drivers for health. How do we begin to focus on putting that heart, mind, and spirit together, as Rose asked us to do? So we need a global learning system. And I'm de delighted that here at this meeting, the British Medical Journal and the Health Foundation are launching, the, uh, relaunching this new journal for quality and safety. And the, in this month's uh, edition is an, a, an addendum which is all about the science of improvement. It'll be all the technical and scientific ways that you can take all these ideas back and begin to implement them very effectively in your uh, work back at home. And next month, IHI.org is going to la launch our new website, and it will be much more focused on social media and all the different kinds of ways that people communicate with one another. Nowadays, I admit um, a little bit of a laggard in this regard. <laughs> and I do think that this is the future, that little kids are going to be born with cell phones and be saying, OMG, I just got born. But in the meantime, we've got IHI.org, we've got the Quality and Safety Journal, we've got IHI's Improvement Map, and we've got the IHI Open School, which are all free resources for students and doctors and nurses, healthcare executives, ways to, to begin to share the learning, the great learning that, that we're seeing worldwide. So I'm really excited about these days with you. Um, I know that I'm going to learn a lot. I hope I will have taught a little. And I'm hoping that you will enjoy teaching and enjoy learning. And just enjoy. Thank you all. Ich wünsche Julie einmal a fantastic Congress. Enjoy.